This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Cameron Brown is going to speak to us. Uh, he has just returned from Israel where he's been working on his dissertation and writing columns for the Jerusalem Post. I want to uh, do a, a full introduction because I know some people didn't see this material uh, in advance. Uh, he is a PhD candidate at UCSD whose dissertation examines why post-conflict negotiations rarely end in peace accords. He holds a master's degree in modern Middle East from the Hebrew University and a bachelor's in political science from the University of Illinois. The former deputy director of the Middle East Research Center, Cameron is presently a columnist for the Jerusalem Post's premier edition. He has briefed senior NATO, U EU, and other officials and has been interviewed by the international press. His academic articles have been published in the Review of International Studies, the Middle East Journal, Israeli Affairs, the Middle East Review of International Affairs Journal, Turkish Studies, and several edited volumes. So I'm very happy to introduce Cameron Brown to speak to us. The title of the talk, as you can of course read, is Almost Within Reach. Why Negotiations Have Failed to Resolve the Arab-Israel Conflict. Uh, I am talking about this, and what I'm going to begin by doing is something quite basic. I want to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of, of history. There are some just very uh, basic facts about what are the issues at stake, where did the sides get to in these negotiations, where did the sides reach agreement, where did they fail to reach agreement, and then to try to understand what are the root causes of this bargaining failure. And in the literature on political science, we, uh, especially over in the department in this university, we talk about bargaining failure. The sides failed to reach an agreement, how come? The, the thing that I'd, I'd like to also make clear is that uh, in going back through all these documents, uh, my own understanding of, of where things are has actually changed. Uh, my, in a certain extent, I'm actually more optimistic uh, because the sides have actually reached, uh, have, have gotten extraordinarily close on most issues, uh, both on the Syrian-Israeli track and on the Palestinian-Israeli track at the same time. And for precisely that reason, uh, and this is actually what's part of what, what has motivated my dissertation research, precisely because they are so close, the question has to be asked, why did they not clinch the deal? And so what we're going to get into and what I hope might be a little more interesting and challenging is to ask that question, why is it, what's this, this riddle, why is it that if they were so close, why not just make those tiny compromises that are left, close the deal already, and stop paying these enormous prices that are inherent in continuing the conflict? So again, I'm, I'm going to be addressing two different tracks, both the uh, Syrian-Israeli track and the Palestinian-Israeli track. As you can see here from what are the issues at stake, the two tracks are quite similar. Most of the most contentious issues really at, at the core have to do with sovereignty. A lot of these questions about borders, about settlements, even some of the questions about security arrangements really all boil down to a question about who has the right to make political decisions over a particular territory? That is really what most of this conflict is about. So let's, let's start taking a, a closer look at what are the issues at stake uh, and, and where did these get to. In particular, let me first remind you about uh, 
the history of these negotiations, the nice thing is we can make it short. Until 1991, there weren't official uh, negotiations. There were some unofficial negotiations, some private negotiations, but in terms of, of actual uh, uh, delegations from the various sides meeting until Madrid in 1991, we didn't actually have face-to-face -face negotiations. There was some shell diplomacy between uh, uh, Kissinger, but by and large, uh, in these tracks, there was never face-to-face -face negotiations on the official level. Since 1991, on the Syrian track, in 1994, the first major breakthrough happened. In, in 1991, by the way, almost nothing happened. Everyone came to the summit and to the meetings afterwards, and, and very little actually happened. The most important part about 1991 is that people got in the same room together. In 1994, on the Syrian track, Bash, uh, Bashar al-Assad, the current president, his father, Hafiz, Hafiz al-Assad, first signaled his willingness to reach a full peace accord with Israel and suggested that the extent of the withdrawal will determine the extent of the peace. Jumping on this, in 1995, the sides under uh, President Clinton and Yitzhak Rabin, the sides uh, started having their very first very serious rounds of negotiations where, where all the, the most substantive issues were discussed and where most of the compromise actually happened. Uh, the two sides didn't reach a deal. Rabin was assassinated. And uh, Benjamin Netanyahu came to power in 96. And although uh, this was all very quiet at the time, we learned in retrospect that in, uh, in the late 90s, 98, he had sent an emissary to Syria to discuss peace and actually went quite far in his willingness to make territorial concessions far greater than he'd ever admitted in public before, uh, before this was all divulged uh, in about 2000. The, the negotiations continued in Shepherdstown in 1999 between the government of Ehud Barak uh, of Israel and again uh, the Assad regime in Syria and were broken off. They, they were supposed to continue in late January of 2000 but didn't. And then in a final last push, President Clinton met with, uh, with Assad in Geneva in March 2000. And there he put the, the last uh, offer to Assad, who uh, not only refused it, but then gave President Clinton a lecture about uh, the history of the arab israel conflict and, and how he would never uh, compromise on one iota of the 1967 line. For the Palestinians, uh, again, the negotiations actually only became serious with the Oslo Accords. Uh, which were signed in 1993, and laid out a framework for negotiations. The framework for negotiations uh, laid out a number of issues that had to be dealt with in the final status, but said that before we hit the final status negotiations, we'd first have confidence-building measures and a number of issues and a number of uh, uh, measures done to try to get the process rolling. It was supposed to be a staggered agreement where you would leave the hardest issues to the end and only then try to, to solve them. Those final status issues were actually only discussed for the first time between the heads of state at Camp David in July of 2000. So again, our history here is actually quite short. Those talks uh, famously failed. Uh, and then uh, very shortly thereafter, the second intifada broke out. And as the intifada was going, <laughs> President Clinton put forth what was then called the Clinton Plan in December of 2000. Israel accepted it with reservations. The Palestinians rejected it and uh, published in the New York Times a long uh, article about why they were not accepting this as a basis for further negotiations. Come January, they actually said that they'd accepted it with major reservations. And uh, talks continued at Taba uh, between, again, the Palestinians and the Israelis. Further progress was made, and the sides came closer to an agreement. But because Ehud Barak was up for re-election, the negotiations uh, uh, were problematic. There was a limit to what Ehud Barak could actually do, because he was, at that time, uh, heading to lose the elections and, and lacked legitimacy to make concessions that were necessary for a final peace deal. There were two other major 
uh, sets of negotiations that are worth pointing to. One is the Geneva Accords that happened after the breakdown of negotiations. And then the second is uh, the talks between Ehud Olmert, the Israeli Prime Minister, uh, and uh, Abu Mazen, or Mahmoud Abbas, the, the uh, Palestinian president who came after Yasser Arafat. Uh, those talks have, uh, we've gotten some insight into those from leaks that went to Al Jazeera and were also published in The Guardian. Uh, some of these were also leaked in Haaretz. Uh, and so we get some insight about where the talks went from there. So let's, let's start looking specifically about where the sides got to in these negotiations. In terms of sovereignty, the, the general formula has been, um, and again, this is based on all of the, the documents that I've mentioned. Uh, many of them were leaked, including there was a working document that was leaked uh, to Haaretz in January of 2000 and was probably the reason why uh, the negotiations didn't continue uh, after that point. The Syrians basically offered, uh, again, the degree of withdrawal would be to the degree of peace, and that by the end of the process, you would have full normalization. Uh, there has never really been, in, in this context, a question about Israel recognition of Syria. That's kind of always been taken for granted. The question was always Syrian recognition of, of Israel. Uh, the withdrawal that would happen uh, would happen three stages, and in exchange for each stage, the Syrians were willing to do more. So for the, for the first stage, the Syrians would declare an end of conflict, and by the third stage, they would normalize fully relations. Uh, let's then look at, at settlements. <coughs> Israel has about 20,000 people living on the Golan Heights. Uh, Israeli law was applied to the Golan Heights in 1981, it's not exactly annexed, but it's not that far from being annexed either. Uh, when you apply law, it's, it's somewhere in between. There aren't a huge number of uh, settlements on the Golan Heights, uh, but what's interesting is that in all of these talks, the Louder document, uh, the talks with Ehud Barak, even in 1995, it was pretty obvious that all of these settlements were going to be removed, and all of the settlers would end up uh, back in Israel. There was some question about whether or not part of this land would be leased from the Syrians for some extended amount of time. We have a precedent of that with the Jordanian-Israel peace agreement. There are huge tra there, there are some small tracts that have been leased for 99 years. Uh, and there was a question about whether the same thing could happen on the Golan Heights. The Syrians have up until now rejected that, saying that we can only talk about these things after everything is said and done, uh, signed, closed, and once we have all this territory back, then we can talk to you about leasing it for 99 years, uh, which, as you can imagine, isn't, uh, is more or less a non-starter. Um, in terms of borders, so, so in terms of settlements, there's actually more or less agreement about what's going to happen in the framework of a final status deal. More or less, the, the deal is there won't be any settlements left. There are some Jews' villages uh, on uh, the Golan Heights, and they would stay. There was an option raised that these Israeli citizens, who are Jews, could decide to go into Israel proper, uh, or they could remain on the Golan Heights and, and become Syrian citizens. Uh, but the, Israeli, the Jewish Israeli citizens living on the Golan Heights would all leave. In terms of borders, this is a, one of the most interesting parts, and, and to me is one of the most riddling. <coughs> there are three different relevant lines that, that separate Israel and uh, Syria. There's the 1923 international boundary, which is based on the 1915, uh, I'm sorry, 1916 Sykes uh, Picot, Picot Agreement. Um, and that international boundary uh, was drawn between the French and the British. Uh, and, and serves as the official international boundary between the two. The war that was fought in 1948, again, Syria did not agree to the partition resolution of uh, 1947, and so went ahead and attacked, uh, as part of the overall Arab coalition, attacked Israel in 1748. Uh, uh, and it's important to note, as opposed to all of the other fronts, and this is going to be one of the, the key issues here, as opposed to the Egyptian and the Jordanian front, uh, the Syrians made progress beyond the international boundary. Uh, same thing, by the way, with the Lebanese front. The Lebanese did not make progress beyond what was previously their international boundary. Which means that the, the 1949 armistice lines 
includes territory that should belong to Israel by international boundaries, but was under Syrian control. Between 1949 and 1967, there were a number of armed skirmishes, and the lines of control changed. But still, come June 4, 1967, the day before the 1967 Six-Day War, there was still territory in Syrian control which had been occupied by force of arms. Uh, and there, there was no international legal reason why it should belong to Syria. The difference here between these lines is, in some places, a question of 10 meters. In some places, it's a question of uh, several hundred. But uh, we are talking about a distance that uh, you, you would even be able to see this on campus. I mean, this is not uh, you know, uh, miles and miles. This is an extraordinarily thin piece of territory that, that really differentiates it. Besides being an arbitrary line, however, there is uh, at least one truly important reason why the line matters. The 1923 international boundary does not touch uh, the canal or the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is Israel's sole freshwater reservoir. Uh, and uh, having that uh, open to, to the Syrians has always been a concern. Now, they said, on the Golan Heights, there are a great number of, of rivers that run into this lake. And one of the reasons for the Six-Day War was a Syrian attempt to divert water from the lake. Still, and giving it back, obviously, this would be a problem. But still, the concern by Israel was that if the Syrians were to be on the water's edge, that the, it would be impossible to say, look, you can't have any of the water. Again, I, I think it's worth looking at exactly where these lines are. Because at the end of the day, this is where negotiations broke down. Of all the issues that were at stake, this is really what, what mattered. Not the settlements, not uh, actually any of the security issues, not the normalization issues. Uh, this, this is really it. So if we've talked about mutual recognition, borders, and settlements, let's think just, or let's, let's uh, just understand where we got in terms of post-withdrawal agreements in terms of security, diplomatic, and tourism. In terms of security, there is always a question about having early warning stations, EWS. And this is, a, this is an issue both for, uh, both for the Syrian Israel track and the Palestinian Israel track. Early warning stations are crucial in a situation like this where Israel has increased vulnerability to a full military attack in order to be able to see what's coming. If the Syrians start lining up tanks on the Golan Heights with an early warning station, you would see this coming well in advance, and you could take steps uh, to thwart that. Same thing we're going to see, by the way, in the West Bank. The Syrians at one point actually agreed to having an American and French manned early warning station on the Golan Heights on Mount uh, Hermon, which is the highest uh, point by far on the Golan Heights. It has a, a especially, uh, I mean, you, you can see deep into Syria from the mountain. It's, uh, it's important, of course, not just for being able to see things visually, but all sorts of intelligence that you can collect, uh, not, again, not just visual intelligence. Diplomatically, again, there more or less was agreement that you would have an exchange of ambassadors and you would have full diplomatic relations, that relations were going to be ruled more or less by, um, by the UN Charter about uh, what relations are supposed to be like between states in peacetime. Uh, and in terms of tourism, more or less, it was clear that uh, Israelis, for whatever reason, are really interested to go to Damascus and to, you know, to swipe uh, a little bit of pita and hummus in Damascus. I, I'm not exactly sure why, but this has always been a real interest um, on the Israeli part. I, I rarely hear about Syrians who want to come down and visit Israel. <laughs> but, but Israelis were, were uh, uh, very interested to make sure that they could go back onto the Golan Heights and that they uh, could be able to go and visit freely in Syria. And I think part of it really has to do with this feeling of being uh, surrounded on all sides uh, and and if you're able to freely visit the countries around you, then it really is sort of a sign that you're truly at peace with them. 
The question then is, so why did Nasser agree? And this is an odd question. I'll tell you why. Because first of all, if it's truly based on principle, then I'm not sure what principle it's based on. If it's based on the principle that, that's laid down in, uh, in the UN Charter uh, and also in, in terms of 242, that uh, the acquisition of land by the force of arms is illegitimate, then they have no right to anything past the 1923 border. If there's some other principle that's based on it, it's not clear to me, but it, because it's the only principle really that, that's of any relevance here. Um, it's also odd, however, even if we were to get away from principles, if we look in terms of real politic, it's also odd. If the Syrians are forever going to lack the material power to change the status quo, why not sign a deal? get as much as they can. In this case, they're being offered the vast majority of, of what's at stake. Why not take almost everything and be done? If they anticipate that things are going to change in the future and they actually want to renege on the deal, and this is what's, what's really puzzling. Let's say the Syrians actually wanted to renege on the deal, so why not sign the deal, get everything they could get, and renege on the deal? Whenever forces change and they become stronger. Obviously, I'm not advocating that this is what Syria should do. I'm just simply saying that this is puzzling. Because if we really don't believe that the Syrians want to keep the deal, they should at least agree to it. The fact that they refuse to agree to the deal is puzzling. Let's uh, look at, and th this riddle is going to come back uh, to haunt us with the Palestinian track, and we will come back and discuss this. In terms of the Palestinian-Israeli track, uh, again, very similar issues are at stake. Sovereignty, and here the, the difference was that uh, it was not clear from the outset that the Palestinians would be getting independence. Uh, before 1993, the, Israeli, the official Israeli position was not necessarily that the Palestinians would have an independent state, but that they would have wide autonomy. That has changed over time, as many of the uh, Israeli official positions have changed over time. That's one of them that's changed. Uh, borders were uh, a key issue, not necessarily around the Gaza Strip, but most in particular around the West Bank and in particular in Jerusalem. Settlements are an issue. Uh, the number of settlers has grown throughout this process, uh, but today it's something about 250, 300,000, depending on if you include people who live in East Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem's an issue. Uh, and other issues are related to sovereignty, even things like should the Palestinians develop their own currency or use Israeli shekels. Uh, there are some issues that aren't exactly related to sovereignty, like refugees, although, again, here there, there is a connection to sovereignty. Does Israel have a sovereign right to say, we won't accept any Palestinian uh, refugees from 1948? I'm going to show you um, a series of maps based on, on various plans over the years. What you'll notice is, first of all, that you, you don't see the Yasser Arafat plan. Uh, he, Arafat in all these negotiations never really put forth a plan. There was never the Palestinian map. Uh, almost all of the proposals were Israeli, and you see them change over time. There have been two uh, proposals of note uh, that were Arab peace plans, the Fahd plan in 1981, uh, Saudi King Fahd, and then the, again, Saudi peace plan of 2002, uh, which were very simplistic in that it was uh, full withdrawal in 1967, uh, recognition, uh, mutual recognition, and uh, eventually there was added to that and it's some sort of a, a mutually agreed solution for the refugees. Uh, they didn't get into details. It was an extraordinarily vague plan and we can ask the question, why did they not bother to get into details? And probably because it, it may not have been a plan that was actually meant to be <coughs> accepted so much as to achieve other goals. Uh, one of the earlier plans is this by Benjamin Netanyahu when he was leader of the opposition and quite against the uh, Oslo Accords. His plan, as you can see, the dark color here is what he envisioned for a Palestinian state, uh, and the rest of it would be annexed to Israel. Uh, the Palestinians obviously weren't very thrilled about that. In July 2000, uh, again, in the first time when these issues were raised at the uh, level of head of state, uh, Ehud Brock came forth with a proposal that would leave 90% of the West Bank 
in Palestinian hands. The Palestinians rejected the agreement, saying that uh, they, they said, look, this leaves us in cantons, uh, and it's not serious. Uh, this was well beyond what uh, any previous Israeli prime minister had uh, advanced. Uh, I mean, again, you, you saw what the Netanyahu plan was like. I can't say that previous, other previous prime ministers were, uh, were nearly as forthcoming as Ehud Barak. Uh, again, the proposal was not only uh, rejected off hand, uh, there wasn't even really an attempt to keep negotiating from that point on. Uh, in this proposal, roughly 90% of settlers would have remained in Israeli territory. The Jordan Valley would have remained uh, for an extended period of time, but eventually would have transferred over to the Palestinians. The Clinton plan in 2000 is, uh, I'd suggest, substantially more generous to the Palestinians. It ends up with somewhere between 94 to 96 percent in Palestinian hands, uh, with settlement blocks ending up in uh, Israeli uh, sovereignty. The idea, the guiding principle behind the Clinton proposal was that most of the settlers actually don't live all throughout the West Bank. There are plenty of settlements spread out throughout the West Bank. Uh, and indeed, the ones who live in the heart of the West Bank do intend to make it impossible to uh, to have a contiguous Palestinian state. That said, um, the vast majority actually live quite close to the Green Line, uh, and it's quite possible that you could annex only about 5 or 6% of the West Bank and include 80% of the settlers. The idea of doing this is that the fewer people who are adversely affected by a peace plan, the fewer opponents to a peace plan you might have. Uh, and by having 80%, obviously it would leave a, a very small number that would need to be removed from their homes and hopefully would minimize the amount of opposition. You could even increase support for such a peace plan by those 80% who suddenly would have their homes uh, with greater international legitimacy. This is the Taba proposal of uh, January 2001. Again, uh, even more generous uh, for the Palestinians. Uh, and then Uh, this, just uh, so you understand, this is a plan for a uh, Palestinian state with provisional boundaries that has come up in the years since, um, but is not really a final status peace plan. Uh, yet another negotiated plan, the Abu Mazen uh, uh, Yossi Balin plan. The Geneva Accords, which we mentioned, you may have heard of before. Uh, this is, again, far more generous to the Palestinians. Settlements that are deeper inside uh, the West Bank, Ariel over there, is not included. Uh, these really only include the ones that are right, across, right next to the Green Line, uh, except for Ma'ale Adumim, uh, which is about a 10-minute drive from Jerusalem. Uh, now, the, the Geneva Accords, we'll get to this in a minute, but the Geneva Accords would uh, only have about 57% of the settlers being annexed to Israel. Again with a very small territorial exchange, only about 2% or something like this, they still end up with 57% of the settlers being incorporated into Israeli territory. Again, 2008, Eud uh, Olmert made a proposal to uh, Mahmoud Abbas, and uh, the pro his proposal was 6.1% being annexed. I should also mention that in exchange, there were, uh, beginning with the Clinton proposal, there was talk about a land swap, that Israel would give up territory inside the 1967 boundaries in exchange for annexing this land, uh, and that that land would come both from the, Gaza, or the land surrounding the Gaza Strip and parts of uh, the West Bank. The exact proportion of that land has shifted over time. Uh, it started out being not a one-to-one -one basis, and increasingly with negotiations, it's now more and more uh, on a one-for-one -one basis. In other words, for every square kilometer that would be annexed to Israel, a, a square kilometer would be uh, given to the Palestinians. And this is one of the proposals, this is Olmert's proposal for Jerusalem. Again, since the plan, uh, since the Clinton plan, the basic uh, premise has been Arab neighborhoods would be part of the Palestinian state, Jewish neighbors would be part of the Jewish state. In uh, the old city, there'd be a special regime uh, set up, and then there's questions about what would you do exactly for the uh, holiest sites in the old city. What you see here is, is shifts over time for the Israeli negotiating position. I say this really because the shifts over time for the Palestinian position are, are much more slight. 
Uh, that being said, again, one of the things that I've, I've come to see over uh, the last few months is that, indeed, there have been more Palestinian uh, uh, changes over time than I think gets into the public eye. Uh, and that has to do with the Palestinian uh, lack of Palestinian willingness to publicize concessions that are being made at the negotiating table. Um, but, but actually, concessions have been made. Uh, again, in terms of what percent of the West Bank should uh, end up with uh, in this future Palestinian state, most of the proposals since Clinton all have it about anywhere from 3 percent. Uh, the Palestinians uh, uh, suggest 2 percent. The Israelis suggest 6 percent. The percent of settler, settlers who would remain within Israel is anywhere from about 60 percent to 80 percent. Jerusalem, while Israel started out with the, uh, the uh, position that there would be a united Jerusalem, starting with Barak, uh, the idea that you would have certain neighborhoods of East Jerusalem become the capital of the Palestinian state, and it's become at this point basically all of the Arab neighborhoods of East Jerusalem become part of the uh, capital of the uh, future Palestinian state, including the Muslim and the Christian quarters in the old city. In terms of refugees, uh, again, traditionally the response by, uh, by Israel was that none would be permitted to, uh, to come back into Israel proper. Uh, eventually there was the agreement that some would, but Israel would determine exactly how many and whom. Uh, in Taba, they started raising numbers that were quite high, 25,000 or 40,000. Uh, Olmert, uh, which uh, came later, suggested 1,000 over the course of 10 years. And uh, in discussions with the American envoy, the Palestinians suggested that they actually had accepted that, uh, that point, suggesting that we actually have agreement more or less on, on the refugee issue. That agreement, by the way, hasn't been publicly discussed within the Palestinian public. If it's true that, uh, that Mahmoud Abbas and Sabah had, had agreed to such a proposal, it's, it is not being uh, laid out in public. Indeed, when Al Jazeera published their uh, Palestine papers, uh, this was one of the things that, that concerned the negotiating team, uh, the Palestinian negotiating team. If, uh, what, what I think comes out of all this very quickly is that the sides are actually extraordinarily close. So close that it becomes frustrating to understand why it is that there is no peace deal. One of the very first things, however, that becomes clear, and I, I raise this because I know in this forum, uh, Professor Gary Fields gave a lecture where he basically said that settlements are the obstacle to peace. Um, one of the things that I want to, to make very clear is that they seem not to be an obstacle to peace. We have a, a number of points of evidence to this effect, and I think it's important to point to them. First of all, that Israel was willing to, uh, and actually did, evacuate all settlements from the Sinai in its deal with Egypt in 1979. It withdrew, it then dismantled all settlements from Gaza in 2005 under Ariel Sharon. When we looked at the, deal, uh, the deals that were being offered with Syria, again, we saw that they had offered to withdraw all settlements. And again, when we look at uh, the deals with the Palestinian, it just doesn't seem like the reason you, you didn't have a deal was because of the settlements, because again, all those dots in the middle of the West Bank, Israel offered to remove them. So despite the fact that in the media we often hear that this is the obstacle to peace, it seems to me that this isn't exactly a credible obstacle to anything. That although the settlers themselves often had hoped that this would preclude a deal, the fact is that it's not, uh, it's not permanent in any way, shape, or form. That decisions could be made that these guys would be uprooted. Um, again, the, the difference here between these sides is so small that it, it really raises a riddle. Why didn't the Palestinians agree to these things? Even, and I have to tell you, inside Israel, the debate throughout the 1990s was not would Arafat accept the deal. Both the left and the right pretty much premised their arguments on Arafat accepting a deal. The difference was what would happen the day after. The Israeli right, their disagreement with the Oslo Accords was, was not that Arafat would say no to a state at Camp David. It's that he would say yes and then use this as a basis for attacks. In the 70s, Arafat had talked about a, a strategy of stages. We take a state on whatever they'll give us, and then we use that as a springboard to attack further. And so the right said, look, this is exactly that. No one understood why it is that he refused the state. And then, as we find out from uh, documents that were released later, 
helped initiate the war, uh, the Second Intifada in, in 2000. Let me suggest some, some of the obstacles to peace, some of the reasons why, despite this extraordinarily narrow difference between the sides, there's no, there's no deal. First of all, there is, uh, when in political science, we talk about a credible commitment problem, that it's very hard for Israel to renege on territorial transfer, but it's very easy to renege on security pledges. And that is, is one of the problems with all of these deals. It hasn't precluded them, but it's, it's definitely an obstacle. Second of all, and this is really um, odd, but, but has, has often been a problem with these negotiations, the order of negotiations, these really what seems to us to be pedantic differences about should we first start talking about borders or, no, or normalization? The Syrian track is especially frustrating on this count. There have been a number of times where negotiations stopped because they couldn't agree on what they're going to discuss first. Why is that? Why, why should they make such a stink about what we're discussing first? And the answer really clearly is because if I can get you to make a concession first on, let's say, borders, well, then we're going to negotiate, you already having made your concessions, and we'll negotiate about what normalization means, and vice versa. If you've made already your concessions about normalization, and you said, OK, full normalization, then we can talk about what exactly a full withdrawal means. Well, I know we're going to talk about. That's, th these issues are, are actually quite, quite important. I want to return, however, to that riddle about Assad. Why is it that he refused a deal that was so close to almost everything they'd requested? <coughs> Part of the problem here seems to be a problem of precedent. Again, there's a difference between the lines between the Golan Heights and the Syrian-Israeli talks and the Palestinian-Israeli talks and those between the two deals that have already been closed, the, jo the Jordanian-Israeli peace talk and uh, the Camp David Accords of 1979, the main difference is that the, uh, the international boundary correlates with the six-day line war, right, the June 4, 1967 line. That's not really the case here. And so you see Yasser Arafat complaining in uh, June 28, this is right before Camp David, uh, and you can read just as well as I, why did Barack fully implement re UN Resolution 425 in South Lebanon, which called for a full Israeli withdrawal to the international boundary. Why did he implement 242 on the Egyptian track? He didn't, but. And on the Jordanian track. Even on the Syrian track, there was an agreement related to the return of all the land, not quite, but that's OK, and the removal of the settlements as happened in regarding the settlements in Sinai. So how can I, Yasser Arafat, accept less? The core problem here, because I, and, and this really gets to my own dissertation research, historically, this wouldn't have been a problem. Historically, when you end wars, people sign peace deals, there are concessions made, and that was pretty much the end of it. If your power, relative power, changed, so then you would start maybe the next war. The fact that, that again, these uh, aren't being solved, that there are no peace deals being signed, uh, it is odd. And I think part of the problem is that now, these leaders face domestic opposition groups. Domestic opposition groups always have an incentive to say, look, that regime over there full of traitors. And any, any uh, concession made can be pointed to as being unnecessary. Because the opposition can say, look, in the future, we could win a war. We don't need to make concessions like recognize Israel. This is Hamas's uh, stance. Or, and this is going to be really, uh, you're going to love this, or the next deal that we're offered is bound to be sweeter than the last. So why, why agree to this one when I know that if I just wait a little longer, I'll get a little bit more? If these deals are really forever, well, then it's worth it to wait just a little bit longer, right? <coughs> this leads to a certain irony. We would think that the Israeli withdrawal from southern Lebanon in uh, May 2000 would be good for peace. Turns out it wasn't. That what happened immediately following the withdrawal, Palestinians started uh, asking themselves, well, maybe we should speak Lebanese. Now, obviously, there, there's no language called Lebanese, right? It's Arabic. It's a different dialect of Arabic, but it's Arabic. And the, but the point was that, clearly, we may not have to make these painful concessions that we're being asked to make, 
when maybe the use of force could be effective. And so there was very few things that I think have been more damaging to the peace process than the Israeli withdrawal from southern Lebanon, unilateral withdrawal, especially the way in, in which it happened, because it happened much faster than it was supposed to. And, it, and if you look at the film from the last two days, uh, it really just looks like the Israelis turned around and, and ran. Uh, and Hezbollah was able to claim this as a big victory. That being said, ironically, and, and probably inevitably, the Palestinians then launched the Second Intifada, and it required, unfortunately, an extraordinarily bloody but, uh, but clear Israeli victory in order for there to be peace, similar with the war in Gaza in 2008 and 2009, without being able to credibly demonstrate to the public that there is no option for war. You cannot have a peace process. If you cannot make it very clear that the opposition is absolutely wrong in its, in its claims about the future, then there's no way that leaders can sell these deals to their publics. Leaders, the only way that they're able to sell these deals to their publics is to be able to say, listen, this is the sweetest deal that we can get, and the option of war is not an option. Ironically, then, it, we'd hope that Netanyahu, being a hawk, would be able to sell uh, a peace deal to the public. The problem is that it's going to be very difficult for Mahmoud Abbas to turn to his people and say, listen, this hawk is offering me the best deal I'll ever get. Because people would say, well, we can just wait a little bit. There'll be an Israeli dove who will come to power. And we've seen what's happened with negotiations. We just keep waiting, and the negotiations keep giving us better deals. So. Uh, that, that, I think, is going to be one of the key stumbling blocks and one of the reasons why Mahmoud Abbas is not really interested in meeting Netanyahu, no matter how much he'll swear up and down that, that he's willing to, and, and he may indeed really be willing to, come to a, a final peace uh, status deal with the Palestinians. But the Palestinians are, are, he can't turn to his own public and say, listen, this is the best deal I could get. Uh, so with that, I'd, I'd like to conclude. I'd like to open it up for question and answer. Uh, and, uh, I look forward to your questions. I've been very impressed, and you've added to my knowledge about the motivations of people on both sides of this conflict and about pointing out uh, how narrow the differences have been at one point. I am puzzled, however, because I didn't hear it in anything, on what the basis of your optimism is. Remember, you start out by saying you're more optimistic. Um, the fact that the differences are narrow uh, doesn't make me particularly uh, optimistic because the history and even the theory of negotiations shows that uh, frequently, although the differences are narrow, uh, the only way they get resolved is through conflict, namely war or strike or something else. So uh, I, I, I would uh, add you to give me some basis for hope because uh, I would love to be hopeful uh, but I'm not. My dissertation begins with the observation that uh, th there's a very famous book uh, by, by Blaney. It was published initially in 1973. Uh, and one of the famous lines that comes out of it is that wars, are, uh, wars end when the causes that began them are resolved. And my dissertation begins with the understanding that that clearly isn't the case because otherwise you shouldn't get the second round of fighting, and that you should get these peace deals. And the fact that sides are, are willing to pay high prices to stay with these ceasefires, despite offers, like what we've seen with Syria and, and, uh, and the Palestinians, they're paying high prices for not agreeing, for staying for these ceasefires. The fact that they're willing to do this, despite having lost wars, right? The Syrians lost in 67 and 73, and lost quite badly and still aren't willing to sign a deal. The Palestinians most recently lost in 2000. So conflict is important in the bargaining process, but it does not necessarily, necessarily resolve the conflict. Why am I hopeful? I'm hopeful because I was extraordinarily not hopeful before I started looking at all these documents, in part because um, you don't hear about Palestinian, Palestinian willingness to make compromises on the right of return. There are still enormous problems, don't get me wrong, but I thought the problems were bigger than they are. 
If the Palestinians indeed are willing to come to some sort of a compromise solution on the right of return, that's enormous. Whether or not, and, and one of my concerns is that they haven't been trying to sell this to their public, because this is going to have to require, uh, in my mind, some sort of a referendum. The only way that it's going to get legitimacy, the, the kind that I care about, is that there'd, there'd have to be some sort of a referendum amongst Palestinians, and that won't successfully pass unless you start selling this to your public as this is what we got. Let's be realistic. Most of the refugees aren't going back to Israel. They're coming here to the West Bank or staying in their host countries, and that's it. You know, and, and we can end the years of suffering, 60 years of suffering. We could end it today, right? And that's, that's what they have to start selling. And unfortunately, they aren't selling it. That they're willing in, behind closed doors to make uh, serious concessions uh, is a sign of hope, but insufficient. So I'm cautiously uh, more optimistic, but again, it's more optimistic than I was because I, I tell you, if, you, if you're in Israel these days, there is more or less a consensus that we are light years from a peace deal. Um, and that's why you have so many people trying to figure out some other solution. My point here is that we may not be light years. It, it may not be inconceivable. Oh, my question is, uh, you mentioned that um, building the wall or building settlements enhances prospects for peace because it raises the ante that if you wait, that things will get worse, so the Arabs would want peace now. On the other hand, when Israel does these things, the Obama administration and the New York Times puts their hands to their heads and said, this is counterproductive. If you want peace, you have to make little steps toward peace, not, again, not to antagonize your opponent, but to uh, make your opponent happy. My, so my question is to you, what is your view on this and why? That's a good question. The, the way you put it was, was quite good. There, there are truly two schools of thought, right? And, and the other school of thought would say what you really need is confidence-building measures. Uh, I don't think that they're truly mutually exclusive, however. Uh, because there, there is a difference between when you're actually in a negotiating process and when you're not. Uh, right now, the sides really aren't negotiating. It's unfortunate in my view, but they, they aren't. They aren't willing to come to the table. And, and let's be realistic here. The, the reason is because the Palestinians have put certain preconditions about what's required, um, and, and they just don't seem to be extraordinarily anxious to get to the table. When you are at the table, you have to have some way to signal to the other side that you are truly sincere in your desire to get to a, a peace deal. And in that sense, then, building settlements is not helpful. Before you get to the table, and the way, to, I think, to convince people to hurry and get to the table, uh, I think, might be different. So that, I, in a certain sense, I'm not sure that they're mutually uh, exclusive. Um, th there is a difference, however, that being said, uh, and, and one concern, I think, that, that you have about uh, certain things that have happened lately is that Israel's asked uh, for help from certain allies, uh, Germany, the United States, in helping to uh, thwart the Palestinian attempt to get uh, statehood from the UN. Um, and in exchange, these countries would like Israel to wait on, or to not announce new building on settlements. And I think it's a, it's a problem, frankly, um, that you would then do something that embarrasses your, your ally. Uh, to his own domestic public or anyone else. So I, I personally think it, it's that announcing new construction is, is a problem. Um, that, that happens to be where I, I sit on these things. But. When um, Netanyahu addressed the Congress here in the United States a few months ago, he was interrupted uh, by applause, I don't know how many, multiple, multiple times, very popular seemed to me when I watched it. And yet when I read the, 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 the newspapers, the world as well as the United States newspapers, it seems like Israel is despised or disliked by so much of the world. Um, why is this? If I write a book on that, I think it would be a bestseller. <laughs> if, I could, if I could answer that question. Let me make a, a swipe at it anyway. 
So uh, we, we can even make it more simple, right, our comparison. We could say Netanyahu gives two speeches, should be pretty similar. He speaks at the UN and he speaks at Congress. Very different reactions, right? We can forget the newspapers. Why is it that in the US it's one way and in the, in the world it's another? Well, in the, uh, a lot of this, again, doesn't have to do with what the words he actually says, right? But rather the interests of the people who are doing the applauding or not applauding. So that no matter what Netanyahu had to say before he walked in the room, those congressmen were going to stand and applaud, and those UN representatives were not going to stand and applaud. He could have given the world's most brilliant speech in both places, it didn't matter, right? People had their opinions on his speech before they walked in the room to hear it. Why is it then that U.S. congressmen have the incentives they have to stand up and applaud, whereas U.N. representatives have very different incentives? And I think this has to do with a, a number of things. First of all, in the U.S., it's quite obvious. Um, the, the domestic lobby, pro Israel lobby, and, and it's important to note, it's not limited to Jewish uh, uh, lobbyists, right? There is a large section of this country that is not Jewish and that is very ardently pro-Israel. That other countries don't necessarily have those same domestic constituents, they have other ones, right? For instance, those with large uh, Arab populations have their own constituents. Those who don't have constituents, either really big Jewish populations nor big Arab populations or Muslim populations, still have other strategic interests like oil, small strategic interest, right? And so what we'd really want to find is, I'd love to find the country that has neither Jews nor Arabs and produces lots of its own oil and doesn't actually, even if it produces its own oil, it's a problem because then it's also dependent on OPEC production to determine its own price. So even they have problems, right? So you'd, you'd want to find like the country that runs on solar energy. <laughs> Actually, unfortunately, Israel is trying to move away from solar, but it's a whole different lecture. So, so that's, I think, what, if I had to write the best-selling book on this puzzle, uh, I think that's, that's what's at stake. Uh, Abba Abon at one point said that the uh, Arabs never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And I think, unfortunately, that's true for the Israelis as well. The, the world doesn't stand still. There's no ideal moment for negotiation. And after the death of Arafat, there was an opportunity there with Abbas and the new prime minister, who's a different kind of character than they've had before on the Palestinian side. Unfortunately, on the Israeli side, you've got Netanyahu. And I do think the, the settlement issue is a, is a sideshow, but a very important one. Because as you go into negotiation, you tell something about your side or where you're going. And by playing around with the settlements, which are not of great consequence, really, ultimately they're going to be removed if there's ever an agreement. Certainly, the, Netanyahu puts the settlements front and center and doesn't take advantage of the fact that there's been a change in the Arab side. And the world around him is not getting any better. It's getting worse. With the Arab Spring, Israel is in a much more precarious position than it was before. And according to Dennis Moore, there have been occasions when the, there have been agreements, and both sides reneged on them. Uh, Arafat, on his part, he came to an agreement, but was not prepared to go home and face the po political problems that went with it. And so did Barack do the same thing. Dennis Moore doesn't have a lot of things, good things to say about either Barack or Netanyahu. But unfortunately, there's no statesmanship here to take advantage of the changing environment. So Mahmoud Abbas comes to power. Now, we have this question, is it, is it really true that Israel never misses an opportunity to miss an opportunity? We have at least two peace deals to suggest that that's not true. In addition to several other instances historically where Israel accepted deals and the Palestinians or the Arabs didn't, right? In 1947, Israel accepts the partition plan, and the Arabs didn't. Uh, you know, and after 73, when we had Camp David, Israel accepted the, the offer, right? Uh, Egypt did as well. 
uh, but the Palestinians, right, uh, they weren't part of that so much. Um, so I, I'm not sure that historically that that's really true. Uh, the, the question specifically about Mahmoud Abbas, um, I, I think if you jump light, you know, ahead of history and you go right to Netanyahu, then you have to remember, but Abbas came to power not just a year ago, but came to power well before then, right? It was about 2004. So in the meantime, there was Sean, there was Omer, and then there was Netanyahu. Sean really uh, had very little interest in negotiating with Abbas. I'll take that as a given. Olmert, quite the opposite. Olmert was quite interested. And Olmert negotiations with Abbas went further than basically any prime minister before him, right? He offered up 94% of the West Bank. Uh, and, and he went quite far in terms of uh, also including a willingness to accept some Palestinian refugees into Israel proper. Um, so I'm not sure that there was no one who was willing to seize the opportunity. The problem with Ulmer was different. The problem is that he had zero public standing mm -hmm. for many different reasons, right? He was an extraordinary, uh, he is being accused of mass corruption on, on a number of different deals, uh, and all that was coming out. He was unpopular because of the way the 2006 Lebanon war ended. Um, and, and in short, there were a lot of things running against him. And he kind of hoped that a peace deal here might change all of that, that he could, in a different way, get the same success that Ariel Sharon had gotten domestically by saying, look what I did. I got a deal. So I'm, I'm not so sure that, that that's the case. Um, and, and regarding Barak and, um, uh, and Arafat, I'm also not, not sure that that's a proper comparison. Barak lost his majority as he went to Camp David in his coalition, continued to negotiate even after the Intifada started, which was violating this, this general rule that they had in Israel about, uh, you know, we don't negotiate under fire. He went and did it anyway. Not only that, but he kept drawing these red lines and then going past those red lines, which was, and this all became very public. And uh, frankly, if anything, this is why he was losing, this is why he lost the election to Ariel Sharon in 2001. So he actually was willing to pay that enormous domestic price that Arafat never did, right? Arafat, I think, uh, was, was a very different creature. Netanyahu uh, has different problems about uh, reliability and, and holding on to agreements, but I don't think it's true to say about uh, Barack's tenure as prime minister. Cameron, thank you very much for, uh, for your wonderful comments here. And thank you all for being a very good audience.